I, I really like bikes. The last time it was actually for like a DC bike conference like about five years ago. Um, but now I am a senior data scientist and manager at Code Academy. Um, and today I'll be talking about anomaly detection with time series um, or my alternative title, how to know when something is terribly wrong. Um, so a little bit about me first. Um, I'm a proud New York R. Um, I've been a member of the New York R community since about 2015 or 2016. Um, but I'm born and raised in Brooklyn, so I've been there my whole life. Um, and I'm currently at Code Academy, but before this I was at JetBlue and New York or DC sports clubs. Um, and here's just some social media stuff if you want to tweet along. Um, I know Emily will be. Okay, so this is my abstract. It's kind of lengthy and you can read the full thing online, but basically my guarantee for this, uh, for this conference is that I will help you uncover blind spots in large data sets and hopefully reduce fire drills at work, hence the uh, burning fire emojis. So um, we have a lot to cover today. So today um, we're going to go over um, time series data, and then we're going to learn how to plot and visualize data on using Google Trends data the tidy way. Um, and we're also just going to explore different algorithms um, for anomaly detection and talk about case studies, how this can be used. Um, at work or for personal, for fun. So this whole talk started because Jared pitched an idea to me um, to do a talk on forecasting. But what Jared didn't know is that I have a really complicated relationship with forecasting. Um, and so why is this? Um, so he knows that I've been working with time series data for a while, but um, in doing so, I realized that as data scientists, when we work with time series data, we want the data to be clean, and ideally, if we want it to be able to forecast it, there are like clear seasonal trends, um, either daily, weekly. This is like Google Trends data for Halloween, so annually we see an uptick. Um, this is like forecastable data. Um, or maybe something like this, where um, people look up movers throughout the year around the same time of the month, and there are a bunch of people who move in the summer, so you see like annually, year over year, you see clear trends. Um, the thing that I realized is that for a lot of companies or public policy or just a lot of data sets that we handle um, aren't forecast grade. So um, there's this clash, right? Like we want to work with data that's forecastable, that we can predict stuff with and model off of, but we often work with data um, that's highly inconsistent, um, terabytes in size, and instead of there being like several key metrics for you to direct your attention towards, um, your boss is like, can you look at this and like these 10 other things. So it becomes really difficult to monitor and a lot of time I feel like my job is diagnosing things and it's like finding a needle in the haystack. So um, I think for data scientists in like, the tech industry, growth is a double-edged sword. So you see a lot of these hockey stick growth charts. Um, and obviously, working for any company, you want it to grow and do well. But it makes it really hard to do anything cool or fun with the data because it's so unpredictable. Um, and the volatility just makes it really hard to do any modeling. Um, so here's an example of some data that I work with. Um, and you can see that hockey stick growth right here. Um, and when I try to project out to 2019 using, um, this is a forecasting package profit, which is open sourced by Facebook. Look at when you, poof, the degree of uncertainty for 2019 is so wide that this forecast is like not actionable or useful. Um, and it's just not, not really great. So, <laughs> um, so I just want to switch gears and talk about dealing with fire drills at work. Um, so how many times, so a lot of the time I feel like my job is like this. Um, so I joke around with my product manager that we're like firefighters and constantly putting out fires. So these are real emails and Slack messages from work. Um, you can see it's like April, August, September, like every month there's a new fire drill. Um, and something is terribly wrong and oftentimes by the time we realize it, it's kind of too late. So I think by the time we saw this, it was already down here. 
and we would have wanted to realize this like way earlier, right? Um, and the reality is something like this can result in like, if you're working for a business, it's a lot of like time and money that's going down the drain. If you're looking at like natural disaster data or something, like you could have, you could be missing like some sort of earthquake or something like that. Um, so I feel like it also, the problem with fire drills is it really detracts from your workflow. So I'm working on something really fun, exciting, like long-term analysis. And then suddenly like I hear from my VP and it's like drop everything, like code red, start working on this thing. Um, and then I just, you know, lust after the thing that I actually wanted to work on. So um, I pitched this idea to Jared to talk about anomaly detection in time series data, um, which I found really useful at various companies I've worked at and even more actionable than any type of like weak forecasting model. Um, so yeah, so anomaly detection leads to earlier detection and hopefully reduces the number of fire drills. Um, and I think a lot of people get the feeling that a lot of the time our work is more like reactive than proactive. Um, so this kind of helps us get ahead of the curve. So here are some applications of anomaly detection. Um, if you remember my uh, DCR promise at the beginning of this talk, it's to help you uncover blind spots in large data sets. Um, so an example of that would be the, ch the chart I showed you before that was breakage. Um, at the last company I worked at in an airline, like flights have gone out empty because of human error, and we would have been able to get ahead of that with anomaly detection. So, um, so this is going into the end of the talk where I will simulate live coding, um, but hopefully by the end of the talk we'll be able to go from this to this, uh, which plots your um, outliers and anomalies really nicely, um, and you can export and like you can do like cool things like uh, send emails to your team when like something drops. So. Um, so let's get started. Um, I put up my talk on GitHub, and I'm going to add the slides after the, the talk, but um, one of the really cool parts about going from a Fortune 500 like non-tech company to a tech company means I can like share my code now, um, which I haven't actually been doing very much, but this is like the first big thing, so hopefully it keeps me accountable. Um, so the first thing we're gonna do is create a data frame. Um, so I showed you some proprietary data before, but I thought it would be cool and fun to use like Google Trends data. Um, so here I pulled the Google Trends data for the word vote um, for 20 or for 2004 to 2018, um, and produced a table here to see that everything worked okay. Um, and then next, the two packages that we use are tidyverse and anomalize. So anomalize actually sits within the tidyverse and it was just released this year in April. So it's really new. Um, it like draws from anomaly detection, which is open source by um, Twitter, but it plays really nicely with the tidyverse. Um, and it's Matt Danso, I think, at Business Science does a lot of cool package work. So um, this is all thanks to his package. So first we prepare the data um, and get it ready for anomalize. And then this is all the code that you have to run, which looks kind of lengthy, but I promise it's not that bad and you can mostly like plug and play stuff afterwards for fun. Um, and you come up with this. So for the word vote, you see some like cool trends here. Um, like these are the presidential elections in 04, Obama, Obama re-election. That giant uptick up there is the 2016 election. And the really cool part is the midterm elections actually outperformed the last few presidential elections because of all the momentum. Um, so that was really cool to see. Uh, and then, so I'll talk more about the methods used up there, Twitter and GESD. Um, but I wanted to replicate this with Florida to see if this was like a proxy metric. Um, so it's kind of cool, you see the seasonal data here. So around the beginning of every year in the winter, um, all the DC and New York like snowbirds jump down to Florida because um, we're too weak for the winter. And then uh, it knows that those aren't outliers, but these over here, this is the 2016 election, and I believe this is the midterms, and I'm not sure what these are, maybe like hurricanes, but um, 
yeah, you can see how like Florida being a swing state correlates with election timing. Um, yeah, so I'm not going to go into this slide too much, but Anomalize also has features where you can like look at the inner workings of how the algorithm d detects the anomalies. Um, so there's just like a lot of really cool functionality you can use. Um, so I'm gonna go over briefly like what method you should use. So I think this is like my cheat sheet for Anomalize. So Twitter and GESC does really well for highly seasonal data. So the voting data that I showed before, um, there are a lot of like annual trends or four-year trends, two-year trends in voting data. Um, but for everything else, standard LOAS and IQR um, tend to do okay. And trend period, I think that's like the fun part where you just apply your domain knowledge. So if you know a lot about like voting or like if you want to analyze like your favorite sports player or something like that, you can do all of that. Um, so going back to one of the examples I used earlier, the moving data, here you can see the difference between, so this is a default, so um, standard lowest and IQR, you can see how like it doesn't really detect the trends in moving data from 2005 to today, um, and it points out some outliers. But when we use the Twitter method, um, it controls our seasonality, so you see these like clean trends and removes the outliers. And then once you pull in GESC, which is also from Twitter's anomaly detection package, you can see how the gray area tightens, so that controls your extreme value. Oh, you can try this on different keywords. I mentioned like sports or like pop culture, so I thought something that would be funny if we're not looking at longer term data would be Pete Davidson. Um, so, so this is, so for those of you who don't know, <laughs> Pete Davidson is a comedian on um, SNL who kind of went viral and like broke the internet this year with, uh, by getting engaged to Ariana Grande, who's a pop singer. So they met around this time and then got engaged shortly after. <laughs> um, so internet went crazy. Um, he instantly shot up in fame. And since this is 2018 data, we can use STL instead of the, the Twitter method. Um, and then the second outlier was a few weeks ago when they sadly broke off their engagement. So, um, yeah, so you can do a lot of cool stuff. I would recommend playing around with it. Um, try this at home. You can use whatever data you like. Um, you can replicate this if you want. You can do, you can look up your favorite politicians. Um, yeah, it's, it's a really cool package and um, I think a good addition to the tidyverse. I'm trying to see. Um, yeah, so there, there's a lot more this package can do. You can see the documentation. I'm linking to it here and I'll add the PDF slides to my GitHub. Um, but yeah, there's a lot more I can do that I, I didn't get to go over today, but hopefully just just pick it up and go. Google Trends is also really fun data to work with. Um, so the last thing I'll leave you with is just good luck and have fun. Um, the New York art community, I think, has like been a real like gem in my life of just like professionally and personally, like the bike rides and pizza, which Jared will hopefully pull up a picture of later. Um, and yeah, like I, I've just met some of the like smartest and funniest and like interesting people with like weird niche knowledge about things um, so that's always fun um, so yeah if you're new to it don't give up have fun with it like analyze weird things do whatever you want but yeah have fun with it